books and other things I do ministry wise teaching just go to my website sacramental living one word dot net I always bring up the quotes of the day it's a daily weekday ministry I do where I provide five quotes that um, are all part of a common theme that day and they go out via email to a BCC audience or it's up to thousands of people now but if you'd like to be included on it just email me at sacramental living one word at verizon dot net you can also find me on YouTube live through the Orthodox Christian Network, their um, OCTV. Just do a search for that on YouTube every Sundays at 1130 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, you know, beginning beginning early October through the end of May, I do my adult religious education live class. I also do a, um, a Zoom class the first and Thursdays of every month for the St. Nicholas Orthodox Cathedral audience. And everybody's welcome to join. Uh, the passcode is 2100-687-480, and the, the password to join is 208156. You're welcome to join. And the last thing I'll mention is the upcoming Christ and Tolkien Visions of Paradise Conference. This will be happening May 19th through the 21st in 2022. You can go to the Christ and Tolkien website um, and buy your tickets. They're relatively cheap. It'll be a wonderful event, especially if you're a Tolkien fan, obviously. Look forward to seeing you there. For those that want to come. I wish you all a blessed time until I'm with you again through this podcast. And this has been Michael Haldis for Ancient Faith Radio. Michael Haldis is the author of Sacramental Living, Understanding Christianity as a Way of Life, published by Eastern Christian Publications. Boldly proclaiming the truth of the risen Christ, this is Ancient Faith Radio, timeless Christianity, 24 hours a day. Search the scriptures as Christ our God said in the gospel. This is Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Join us for an interactive verse-by-verse study of the Bible with one of Orthodoxy's most respected biblical scholars. Study along with us and share your comments and questions by calling 855 855- Two three seven two three four six. That's eight five five two three seven two three four six. Here now is Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master who loves mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge and open the eyes of our minds to understand thy gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things that are well-pleasing to thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father who is from everlasting, and thine all-holy and good and life-giving Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Welcome, dear brothers and sisters, to Search the Scriptures Live. I'm Dr. Jeannie Constantino, and today's date is July 25th. 2022. I'm so glad you could be with us today or you're listening a little bit later. That's okay. We can't all listen live. It's hard for me to do that. But if you're just joining us, we're discussing the early church, the preaching of the apostles in the primitive church. This is not just early church. This is the very, very, very beginning. So it's really what we call the primitive church, which I think is probably like the first century, we could say the before the year 100, that's really primitive church, not just early church. Early church, I would say, you know, continues for a few centuries. So we talk about St. John Chrysostom. He was part of the early church, but not part of the primitive church. So um, there's no rules for such, you know, descriptions, such adjectives. Anyhow, what is chip, what is early versus what if, what is primitive, et cetera. But This is definitely primitive because we're still talking about St. Peter's speech on the very first day of the church, the the day of Pentecost, what's called the birthday of the church. And we're going over it and a couple of other speeches. We will continue for a couple of chapters anyhow 
in uh, in Acts to look at St. Peter's speeches. He's the main actor here, the beginning of part of Acts. Later, it becomes St. Paul. He becomes a, the main focus of the book of Acts. And he also has some very important speeches, which tell us a lot about how the church uh, proclaimed the gospel to the world at that time. So Peter is the focus at the beginning, and he's the one who's giving all of these sermons, and he's the one who's speaking to a Jewish audience. Later it will be St. Paul, and sometimes he's speaking to Jewish audiences, but many times he's also speaking to Greek audience, or at least to Hellenize Jews. So um, the reason why we're looking at these um, speeches here in the book of Acts, and I also had mentioned to you that this is the classic style of writing history at this time. So St. Luke is sometimes called Luke the historian because he's writing this, the very first history of the early church. And it's, it's impossible for me to imagine what life in the church would be like if we didn't have this book. It is so important because it tells us what happened after the ascension, right? How important is that? It's tremendously important. But he doesn't just write what happened in the style that we might follow today if someone asked us to write a piece of history. He's writing it in the style of a Greek writer because Luke was educated he was Hellenistic. He was Hellene. He was either a Greek or he was Ele educated in Greek learning. So um, he was probably more from Asia Minor, but uh, rather than being from Greece itself, but nonetheless, he would have been called a Greek and he knew Greek learning. So he wrote in the style that people would expect a book of history to be written. And that included a lot of speeches. So the main characters of many books of Greek and Roman history include a lot of speeches because this is how we learn about the, the figures and we learn about what they did and what happened. This is how they did it in a more narrative style. We would do it. We would not usually write history in a, a narrative style like this. So at any rate, the question is, how do we use these so how do we read these speeches to learn how the early church or the primitive church convinced first the Jews and other pagans that Jesus was the Messiah? Because, you know, that was a hard sell. It was very difficult, not only for Jews, but also for pagans. And, you know, I think that because we live in a society in which the dominant religion is Christianity. We still are the largest religion in the world. And in America and the Western world, there are more Christians by far than other uh, world religions. It's hard for us to really imagine a time when hardly anybody in the whole world was a Christian. And what was that like? And how did you convince people to believe this crazy idea? Because this really was, as I said, a very hard sell because we kind of think, well, everybody just, they were told these stories about Jesus. I don't believe that. You probably don't. But sometimes you hear people talk about ancient people as though they were all stupid. They were all gullible and people just told them stories about Jesus and they believed it. And that's not the case at all. These people were just as intelligent as the rest of us. And perhaps in, in certain ways, especially in, we could say consuming, um, learning by listening, which is what they're doing. We consume information now visually very often in the television, but also by reading. But these were auditory learners. People learned by listening to people, and they just didn't believe everything they heard, especially something as very difficult to accept as the cross. And notice here in St. Peter's preaching, he never shrinks from mentioning the cross. None of the apostles were ashamed of the cross, even though it was something very shameful. Jesus was considered cursed, but they didn't sort of hide that. So let me give you an example. If you, if you welcome somebody to your door who is of, of a different religion, like somebody who's Mormon or um, Jehovah's Witnesses, they won't tell you the truth of their beliefs right away. They hide them. Okay, so the Mormons won't tell you, for example, that they believe in many gods. They will tell you, no, we have one God. Well, that's because there's one God of this planet, but there are many other gods on other planets. That's what they would say, but they're not going to tell you that. 
They don't tell you that they believe that you too can become a god. Instead, they try to present themselves in a very palatable way. They present their message as though they're just another form of Christianity. The same thing with Jehovah's Witnesses. They say, yeah, do you, if you say to them, do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yes, we believe in Jesus. That's never the question. The question is, what do you believe about Jesus? Oh, he was the son of God. Do you think so? Really? Is he equal to the father? Of course not. But they're not going to tell you that. So here we see quite the opposite. We see Peter and other apostles openly proclaiming that Jesus was crucified. And this was a pretty scandalous thing. And Jesus, because Jesus was considered cursed for that reason, the cross was the primary reason why Jesus was rejected by the Jewish people and is still the number one reason today, if you ask Jews, why Jesus isn't the Messiah. That is the number one reason, because he was crucified. So you can see what a huge hurdle that was for the apostles to overcome. And, uh, but also the pagans. What about the pagans? Do you think that they thought crucifixion was a great thing? Of course not. It was a disgraceful thing. It was, it was, it was a disgusting thing. You know, you died in a shameful manner. That's the whole idea behind the cross. So whether you were Jewish or pagan, um, you consider the cross something shameful, something repulsive, something to be rejected. So the idea that God or a God, if you're a pagan, would willingly choose to suffer and die on a cross was absolutely ludicrous. And we have to remind ourselves of that because we forget that in our culture. We see the cross and it's a, a symbol of inspiration and hope and, you know, resurrection, all these other lovely things. We see the cross and it, it brings us joy, but it wasn't like that at this time. So um, it was ridiculous to consider that anyone, especially a God, would willingly choose to become a human being and then to die on a cross. And this is the reason why the first real heresy to threaten the church developed, the heresy of docetism, that Jesus wasn't really human. He only seemed to have a body. He didn't really have a body. He was not God incarnate. He just looked like he was human, but really he never took a body because they thought that was impossible that any God would choose to do this. But this is, of course, the glory of the Christian faith. And it is the only faith that teaches that God actually became a human being and was willing to die, die this way for us. That's the w wonderful message of the gospel, but it's very hard to accept. So St. Peter and other apostles boldly proclaimed the cross. This was the gospel. Jesus Christ crucified, Jesus Messiah. That's what Christ means. It's not his last name, Jesus, the Messiah. So this is why St. Paul said to the Corinthians, we preach Christ crucified. We preach a crucified Savior. It's, you know, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness. That's putting it mildly, calling it foolishness to the Gentiles. They, th they thought you were an, a moron. That's the word that's where we get the word moron from. It's from this Greek word for being a fool. You're a fool to believe this. So many people who became Christians, their family did not accept this. Now, remember how the Lord foretold that this would happen, that families would be divided when he said, I've come not to bring peace to earth, but a sword. He didn't mean that people should be fighting each other with swords. He meant that he would, his message and whether or not people accepted him would divide families. And of course that happened back then. And it's still happening today. There are many people who choose to believe in Christ, whether they're atheists or, or they're Muslims or they're Buddhists or they, they come from some other Christian background, they become Orthodox Christians. This divides families very often. They get rejected by their family or even in the culture. You decide to stand for Christian values and your, your friends don't agree with you. Your friends want you to go along with whatever it is that they're promoting. And you say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that because I am a Christian. So this is the, the message of the gospel. And Jesus Christ divides people, not because he wants division, but because that is the outcome of the preaching of the gospel. 
We have no appreciation for what it took to believe in Christ during the first century or even the second century, because most people believed that these early Christians were literally crazy, literally, literally crazy. Their families thought that they had lost their minds to believe that God or a God, I'm saying that because, of course, the pagans believed there, there were many gods, that a God would come to earth and die on a cross. Well, how could you believe such a ridiculous thing? And so, and then, and then they, they could not convince the early Christians that this was not true. So, of course, we, we do have and we know of stories in which uh, people were, especially young people, were martyred by their own parents, right? They just were so offended by this idea. So I'm telling you that this so that you don't imagine that there was ever a time when the gospel was preached and easily accepted because the true gospel is still under attack today. Today it is still it is, it is acceptable, of course, socially acceptable to be a Christian unless you really stand for what the Christian faith teaches. But it wasn't easy in the first century, whether you were a Jew or a pagan. So don't imagine that it was ever, that it just should be easy today. Instead, you will likely be called upon to stand for Christ in a way that perhaps you didn't anticipate, in a way that might cause you to lose friends, to lose business, to lose other associations, maybe to have to go to another church because you simply cannot accept what is being said by your friends or what is being asked of you in a business situation or what is being taught by a particular parish. So we have to be prepared to do that and don't think it was ever easy. Never, never was it easy. So why did anyone believe the gospel? If this message of a crucified Messiah God was so difficult to believe, even in, especially we could say in those early days, why did anyone believe the gospel? Well, first of all, there were eyewitnesses. Those were the apostles. And you will notice as Peter has, is, does his preaching, he says, we are all witnesses to these things. And it's not just the 12. Remember that the term apostle did not apply only to the 12, but to anyone who had been an eyewitness to what Christ said and did, and especially had seen him alive again after the resurrection. So this included a much larger group, but there were lots of eyewitnesses. So there were hundreds of apostles. So there were lots of eyewitnesses around. And as he begins preaching, the crowd there in Jerusalem is also a witness. Remember, he says, you yourselves are witnesses. How are they witnesses? Maybe not to the resurrection, but they were witnesses to the signs that Jesus did. Remember, a sign for the Jews may, means miracle. And they had seen many, many miracles that had been done by Christ. And this is why he had such a following. Um, in, in Judaism, Jesus did not just have 12 disciples. Jesus had thousands and thousands of followers. People believed he was either a prophet or really the Messiah because of the miracles that he did. Because these are the things that were foretold by the prophets like Isaiah, that he would do these signs that the blind would see and the lame would walk and the deaf would hear. Jesus was doing things, incredible miracles every single day, and everybody knew it. And people had seen him do these things. So they were witnesses to the signs that Jesus had done, but they also knew that he had been crucified. And of course they, they allowed it to happen. It, it happened. So Peter will say, you crucified him. So they, um, so they, they knew that what Peter was saying about the miracles of Christ was true. And they believed that he was probably the Messiah. But then when he died on the cross, they said, well, obviously he can't be the Messiah because he died or he died on the cross. So that's why they were not believing in him. They Very few people continued to believe in him after, you know, those three days. But after the three days, of course, we have the resurrection. At any rate, so the first reason why people, why did everyone even believe in the gospel when it was so hard to accept? First, because of the witnesses. There were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And even as I said, you could say that the people in the crowd were also witnesses. They knew that what Peter was telling them about Jesus was true because he had done so many signs among them. Number two, 
the signs continued to be done by the apostles. The apostles themselves were working miracles. This is something which we will see in the next chapter with the healing of a paralyzed man. And there are many, many references in the book of Acts to the, the various apostles doing many different miracles to um, people being healed because of cloth that had come from St. Paul, you know, things that St. Paul had touched or Peter's shadow passing over somebody. So they became very famous in the city of Jerusalem for their ability to do these signs. So of course people held them in very high regard. And this, you can't, you can't argue with the results. You can't say, well, that doesn't mean anything that they did these things. In the next chapter, we'll, we'll see about a man who was paralyzed from the time he was born for 40 years. He had never walked. And now all of a sudden he's able to walk. How is this possible? Explain that. So there's something is going on here and the people realize that. So it was the witnesses, that they were witnesses. Number two, that the signs that were done by the apostles and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles during this period of the primitive church. It was so obvious what people saw and what they experienced by the movement of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit convinced them. And perhaps this is the reason why the activity of the Spirit was so vibrant in the early church, certainly because they were bit better believers than we are. That's true. We don't have the faith of these um, early believers. We don't, we're not willing to sacrifice. We're not selling everything we have and giving it to the church the way these early believers did. We will talk about that also. We, d we don't have their faith or their commitment. Jesus is, occupies usually just a little corner of our life, maybe. So that's one reason why we don't have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But also, it has been said by the Holy Fathers of the Church that the Spirit was especially strong, the outpouring was especially strong in these early days because these believers needed it. And sometimes when people, sometimes a miracle will take place. And you can ask, well, why did this happen? It's because the person who experiences it needs it. They need it for their faith. And, and I've known many people to, to, to whom extraordinary things have happened, but not to other people. And I can see how it was that they needed this. And God always gives us what we need. Sometimes he doesn't give it to us because we don't need it. We're just asking, asking to get out of some kind of a jam. But sometimes we need it for our faith, to strengthen our faith. And so God knows what we need, and this is uh, how he acts. So... In this earliest stage of the life of the church, the outpouring of the Spirit was needed. And this kind of confirmation was needed because without it, it would be very difficult for people to believe. In other words, they're not just believing because Peter is a really great orator. It's not that they're convinced by the reasoning, the human logic of Peter. You see what I mean? There was also the great signs that, that, that the apostles did that they were doing the same kinds of things that Jesus had done, you see? So I don't think we can discount that. All right, so we are in the um, in chapter 2 of Acts of the Apostles. I want to begin with, uh, after he quotes the, um, I'm going to re refresh your memory about what St. Peter said. When he begins up to, stands up to speak at the beginning, he quotes the prophecy, Joel, tells them that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit was foretold by the prophets, and then he stands up and he begins to talk about David. And this is where uh, we we ended last week, but we'll continue our discussion of David. We did talk about him, but we didn't finish. So I'm on chapter 2, verse 22 of Acts of the Apostles. Here are the words of St. Peter. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. 
we've talked about all of this last week, but notice that he's not saying you personally. He's not speaking to the, he's speaking to them as a group corporately, the Jewish people through these particular lawless rulers. But God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So this is where we had left off last time. He quoted this psalm, which was by King David or the prophet David, talking about the Messiah. And it's a messianic psalm. It is a psalm that foretells not only the death of the Messiah, but the fact that he would not decay. He would not stay in Sheol, the place of the dead. So this is not when he says, uh, when he's speaking, I saw the Lord, etc. He's not speaking about himself, that his soul will not remain in Sheol, that he will not see corruption. David is not speaking about himself, but he's speaking the words of Jesus, of, of the Messiah. Okay. So this is where we left off last time. And we were talking about how, well, when this, when this speech was being given by St. Peter at the, uh, outside the upper room, because this is where the Pentecost took place, they were in the upper room and they, after receiving the outpouring of the spirit, they came outside to the streets of Jerusalem. And that is located, that room is located very close to David's tomb. David's tomb, David died in the year 1000, approximately BC. So even in the time, even in the time of the first century, his tomb had already been there for a thousand years. Just imagine that. Okay. So everybody knew where David's tomb was and people still go and visit it. So he's referring to David because he's right there. And because David is very, very important as a prophet, you will notice that the Orthodox Church tends to refer to refer to him as the prophet David, not so much as King David because of his uh, composition of the Psalms. And many of those Psalms are prophetic because he had the Holy Spirit when he when he wrote these things. So let us continue. We will read the remainder of St. Peter's uh, speech right here until we get to the critical part, and then we will take a little break. Brethren, I may say to you confidently of the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us today. So I mentioned why he's mentioning the tomb, because the tomb was right there. But not only that, as great as David was, he's dead. And he's still dead. He died a long time ago. His tomb is here and he is still dead. Being therefore a prophet, notice how he, Peter calls David a prophet. And knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke. That's David. David foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So here we can see that Peter recognizes that this prophecy, this psalm, is not David talking about his own burial, but David speaking about the Messiah, that he would not stay in Hades, that his flesh would not decay. And, and Peter continues, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Notice again, how important the apostolic witness is. We are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you see and hear. Now, he also mentioned here that I did not stop to explain is that God had sworn an oath to him. So that's to David. So we're going to talk about that and why it was important after the break. What was that oath? Join me after the break. 
Dr. Constantinou will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. We talk about prayer, fasting, and almsgiving as the three spiritual pillars of the Orthodox faith. But the the sad truth is that while we spend a lot of time in the church talking about prayer and fasting, we devote relatively little time to talking about almsgiving. Money. What does that have to do with the gospel? The Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative is pleased to announce the sixth annual Orthodox Advanced Leadership Conference. And this year's theme is money. The gospel changes everything. Parish leaders and emerging leaders among the clergy and laity who serve the local parish, diocese, or orthodox nonprofits are encouraged to attend either in person or online. You can learn more information about this September 16 to 18 conference by going to orthodoxservantleaders.com. That's orthodoxservantleaders.com. We have to choose to recover the basic foundational understanding of the place of money and salvation. This has been a public service announcement of Ancient Faith Radio. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. Okay, so what was Peter talking about when he said that God swore an oath to David? This is commonly called the Davidic covenant. And this is something you should know as a person who is informed about the scriptures. So what is the Davidic covenant? This is when the Lord spoke to the prophet Nathan, who was the court prophet for uh, David. We usually think about Nathan in connection with the, um, the David and Bathsheba. He's the one who told David that little story about the man who, who stole a lamb from a poor man, the wealthy, powerful man who stole a lamb from a poor man. That was Nathan. But this is found in Second Samuel, or we could say Second Kingdoms, 7, 8 to 16. So here is... Uh, what the Lord is telling Nathan, the the message the Lord is t- telling Nathan to deliver to David. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts. I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house when your days are fulfilled. He doesn't mean like a structure. It means like a dynasty, a dynasty. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, that means when you die, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So, The Lord promised David an everlasting throne or kingdom that one of his descendants would rule forever. So this is where the Jews got the idea, and correctly, that the Messiah would be descended from David. But of course, they anticipated the return of an earthly kingdom that would last forever. But that an everlasting kingdom would be established by one of David's descendants, was very important. It was a very important part of the Messianic expectation. And it still is for those Jews who still believe that there will be a Messiah, because a lot of them have kind of given up on that. 
the the most religious, the most traditional ones, of course, still believe that there will be an actual person who will be the Messiah. But many have kind of given up on this uh, promise. But this is why the Jews knew and anticipated that the Messiah would be descended from David. And this is why the people in the crowds shout out to Jesus and call him son of David. This is why it is a messianic title. It's not because they didn't know that his supposed father was Joseph. It's because this is a messianic title, because it's a way of acknowledging that he is the Messiah and he's called son of David because there was this, you know, universal expectation that the Messiah would be this victorious conquering Messiah King would be descended from David. So this is why when the angel Gabriel visits the Virgin Mary for the Annunciation and she is told, uh, she is told that she's going to conceive this child. She's given this same information. Listen to this. This is the angel Gabriel speaking to Mary in the gospel of Luke and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. That's his divinity. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. You see that that's the Davidic covenant and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's the, that's the house of Israel. Jacob is, is also named Israel and of his kingdom. There will be no end. So there you have it. That, that is the Davidic covenant. And so this is what Peter is reminding the crowd about this prophecy that there would be an everlasting kingdom that God made this prophecy. Think about that more than a thousand years before. But of course, God is faithful to his promises. Peter says God has sworn an oath. And this meant that this promise would be fulfilled. And Peter is telling the crowd that this promise was fulfilled by Jesus of Nazareth, who was the Messiah. And then as, as Peter continued, he said, for David foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, the Messiah that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Now, remember that he has already quoted that Psalm earlier in this passage in Acts of the Apostles. He quoted that line from Psalm 16. You will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let your Holy One see corruption. Well, the Holy One, of course, is is the way God is referred to in the scriptures. God is the Holy One. How could the Holy One, how could God ever see corruption? Only if he was incarnate, only if he had a body. So even that is a remarkable prophecy that God himself would become incarnate. Can you see that? That's that's really remarkable. But it was very difficult for, for the Jews, even though they knew these Psalms and recited them and sang them, you know, they knew them by heart. The Psalter was their hymnal. They knew these things. They didn't understand them because they were prophecy. And it often takes a long time for prophecy uh, to be understood. Sometimes the prophecy is not understood until it is fulfilled. Oh, now we see how the Holy One might see corruption, but he did not see corruption. You see that? So this is why, this is a little bit of an aside, but I'll stop and telling this to you. Anyhow, this is why we have to be really careful with the book of Revelation and try to pretend, don't ever pretend that you can understand it or interpret it perfectly, how things are going to play out in the end times. We really can't know because it will be fulfilled, but probably not in the way that anyone anticipates. We just don't know how God works and how these prophecies will be fulfilled. So what does this mean that he will not see corruption? Corruption means the body will not experience decay. And when we die, the body decays. The body decays because we have died. That's a normal process. And we died because we had sin. But Christ, remember, allowed himself to die. He was life by nature. He is God by nature. His body did not see corruption because his body was sinless, just as his, you know, he was sinless as a human person. He was perfectly the same as us in our humanity, 
He had the same usia, the same essence of us as our humanity, but he did not have sin. Therefore, he was not held by death. He, he could not be held by death. He did not remain in Hades, nor did he experience corruption. He conquered death because he was sinless. So then we could ask the question, well, then why did he die at all? Why did Christ die? Remember, it's not it, it's just the, the payment of the price for sin or that sort of thing. He died in order to conquer death so that he might empty Hades of the dead, that he might defeat the devil who had the power of death. So Christ descended to Hades. That he descended to Hades is very well attested in the New Testament from this place and another place as well. He went to Hades, not to hell, because hell is the place of torment, of punishment. Hades is the place of the dead. And he preached to the dead. And he gave them the opportunity to accept him or to reject him. So even the dead have had the opportunity to accept the gospel or not. Okay. So, so Peter continues after quoting the Psalm, he says that, you know, the David foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. He was not abandoned his flesh to Hades. His flesh did not see corruption that God raised him up, that we are all witnesses to this. And, um, that, the psalm was this prophecy that was fulfilled. So the crucifixion was part of the plan of God. It was foretold by the prophets and the resurrection of the Messiah was also foretold by the prophets. And now this is the person. So now he's saying, yes, this was foretold, but here he is. This person is the Messiah. This Jesus is the one who got crucified. He's the one, this particular man. So you see, he's not just trying to convince them that the prophecies really speak about the crucifixion of the Messiah, the resurrection of the Messiah, but this is the Messiah. Jesus is the man. This man, this Jesus, this one was the one who was crucified and slain and risen from the dead. And we who knew him, who were his disciples, who traveled with him, who saw him alive again after death, we are his witnesses. So I mentioned last time that we have to be very careful when we say that God raised Jesus. This is not typically how we express it in the Orthodox Church, God raised Jesus, because this suggests to people that Jesus didn't have the power to raise himself. And of course, that is not true. He being God equal to the Father, has the power of life and death. If he could raise others, he certainly could raise himself. And he said in the gospel of John, I have the power to lay my life down. I have the power to take it up again. So we don't misunderstand that verse. And, but notice how often St. Peter mentions him himself and the other apostles as witnesses. This is why the apostles were so important in the early church. This is the reason why the Orthodox church insists upon following apostolic tradition because they are the witnesses to all of these things. And we rely on them. We don't rely on some other person who came along later, who has his own ideas about Jesus Christ, whether that is Joseph Smith or, you know, or, uh, or Luther or Calvin or anybody else. We don't trust the opinions of anyone. It is apostolic tradition. What did the apostles teach? This is what we believe, and we preserve it. That's who we are. That's what distinguishes Orthodox Christianity from everybody else, even the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church has accepted many doctrines over the years that were promulgated by popes. So they changed a lot. So we accept nothing that isn't already part of the tradition. So as St. Peter continues, this is what he says. I'm on verse 33 of chapter two, Acts of the Apostles. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you see and hear. That's the Spirit, poured out the Spirit. For David did not ascend into the heavens. That's right. 
David, as great as he was, he didn't go up to heaven. His tomb is right here. Peter's probably pointing at the tomb as he preaches. David didn't go up to the heavens. It is Christ who went to heaven, Jesus Christ. But David himself says, the Lord said to my Lord. And now Peter quotes this extremely important psalm, which we're going to get to in a moment. But before we talk about this, I want to remind you about these important figures of Judaism. I want to show you how Peter is appealing to this particular crowd. So we began this lesson by me telling you how it is that the church was preaching the gospel to the Jews. This is one reason why Acts of the Apostles is so important, not simply for, sort of, quote, historical information, but for us to understand the way the church presented Jesus Christ to the Jewish people who were not believers in order to convince them that Jesus really was the Messiah. You see, they had to convince them. They didn't just say, oh, okay, I guess, you know, we're all so stupid, we're just going to believe whatever we're told. It was, wasn't like that at all. They had to be convinced in their own way. So how do you convince the Jews? By showing them fulfillment of prophecy. So uh, everything I'm telling you, by the way, this is what Chrysostom keeps talking about, how, how Peter, but it's very, I will tell you, I've been reading Chrysostom sermons on Acts, and they're really, really difficult. If you have, have tried to read Chrysostom on Acts and have a lot of trouble, they're very difficult to slog through. That's why I'm not really reading to you too much from Chrysostom, except for those very interesting parts that I read already. And I'll tell you why, why they're difficult and why I'm not reading so much from Chrysostom now. Um, when Chrysostom preached, there were stenographers who took shorthand, who wrote down his sermons. And there were usually three of them in the church at any given time. This was not just him, but other famous preachers like Origen, like Augustine. They would write down their speeches, their sermons as they gave them. Chrysostom did not have time to sit down and write these things. So he preached and people took notes. And then these three stenographers or, you know, you know, they like would take di dictation. They would give their notes to the person who had preached and then they, they would be corrected and they would be sort of um, edited into a smooth, smoother version. Now, they didn't take out parts that were extemporaneous, like, why are you watching the lamp lighter? Uh, or why are you yawning? You should be paying attention. These kinds of things that little asides that Chrysostom made, they didn't take those out, but they did organize the comments. Now, this set of sermons on Acts of the Apostles was delivered by Chrysostom when he was Archbishop of Constantinople. Today we would say patriarch, but they didn't have that title back then. So he was extremely busy and he did not, I think, have time to look at the drafts. So what we have um, is a very, very rough series of sermons and they're really, really hard to read. A lot of repetition, a lot of kind of fits and starts. It's difficult to slog through. So if you've tried reading Chrysostom and Acts, um, that's why it's not your fault. They're just really difficult because I think they were never polished by him because he simply didn't have time at any rate. So what I'm trying to tell you is this, this is one of the things that Chrysostom mentions as he's analyzing this sermon by St. Peter on the very first day of the church, the day of Pentecost, he mentions how Peter appeals to the Jewish people by mentioning David. And then later in later speeches, he mentions Abraham and then he mentions Moses. And of course, this, this is how you would make your case to the Jewish people by mentioning these great heroes who are and who still who were and who still are the greatest figures in Judaism. Abraham was the father of the nation, the model of faith. He was so meritorious. People said, I am a son of Abraham. I am a daughter of Abraham. This means I have uh, entry into the kingdom of heaven. This is what they believed because Abraham has prepared a place for me. You know, I'm going to be right next to Abraham. I'm going to be in the bosom of Abraham when I die. Why? Because I am a descendant from Abraham. This is what the Jewish people believed. So Abraham was great. Then Moses, 
the great deliverer. He delivered the people from slavery in Egypt, the great lawgiver of Israel. He gave Judaism its shape, its way of life, by giving the laws that shape everyday life for the Jews. And of course, the last one is David. Abraham, Moses, and David are the three most important figures in Judaism. Why David? Because you perhaps you think about David and Bathsheba, right? That couple really, really big sins that David committed, adultery and murder by having Uriah um, sent to the front lines. But David, nonetheless, of course, he repented. He repented deeply, and God forgave him. That's, that's where the 50th Psalm comes from, or 51 if you're using the Western numbering. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy great mercy. That was his psalm of repentance. So David, nonetheless, in spite of that failing, in spite of that, those big sins, he was considered the ideal king, the model king. All subsequent kings of Israel and Judah were compared to David. Why was he the model king? Because he was absolutely devoted to the Lord, did not worship other gods, did not allow the worship of other gods in the kingdom. So all of these important figures are mentioned by St. Peter. Uh, here it's David is emphasized, but in the next speech in chapter three, we will see Peter refer to Abraham and to Moses. We'll get to that later. But for now, he quotes verses from this psalm, which will you surely will recognize. The Lord said to my Lord, this is what he says. Let's see. Peter says this. David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself says, David did not go to heaven, but he had this vision. Okay. He had this inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thy enemies a stool for thy feet. So here he's quoting this psalm. So from that, Peter draws a conclusion. All right. And here's the conclusion. Verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So he's showing that Jesus Christ fulfilled these prophecies and that he is both the Lord and Christ. So he's not just the Messiah. He's not just a human being, but he's also the Lord. So let, we're going to take a look at this verse. The Lord said to my Lord, which is Psalm 109 in the Septuagint and Psalm 110 in the Western numbering. So, I want to read to you, it's not a very long uh, psalm, let's read it. This is from the Septuagint version, Psalm 109. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, that was my father opening the door and closing it, until I make thy enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send out a rod of power for thee out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. With you is the dominion of the days of your power and the splendors of your saints. I have begotten you from the womb before the morning. The Lord swore and will not repent. You are a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek, the Lord at your right hand has dashed in pieces kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill up the number of corpses. He shall crush the heads of many on the earth. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. So there are some passages or some verses in there that you certainly re recognize. He will, you are priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord has sworn, you know, that out of the womb before the morning star have I begotten thee, the Lord has sworn, and will not change his mind. So anyhow, the point is that this, why, why does Peter quote this psalm? First of all, even by the Jews back then, 
the ones who did not accept Jesus as a Christ, this was recognized as a messianic psalm. And notice that this is a very triumphal psalm, that the Messiah will defeat his enemies, that he will put his, the, the Lord will put his enemies under his feet as he, they will be a footstool. In other words, complete um, triumph, complete victory. So um, that the Messiah would ultimately prevail and triumph. So this was a messianic psalm. And the who is the person that quoted this prophecy before Peter? Well, of course, you know, it's Jesus. Jesus quoted this. If you recognize it, you probably recognize it from the Gospels when he was disputing with the Pharisees, when the Pharisees were questioning him and trying to trap him and trying to trick him with the... Um, the uh, coins, you know, uh, shall we pay taxes to Caesar or not? This was a question about the tribute tax. And then the Sadducees asked the question about the woman who was married to seven husbands. And then the, there's a, a scribe who says, what is the greatest commandment? So they were always challenging him. And uh, last, then he stops and he says, I'm going to ask you a question. He said, uh, who was the, who's, um, the son of David, who's, who's son, the Messiah, whose son is he? And they said, David's son. And then the Lord says, well, then it, how is it that David speaking in the spirit, you see, they recognize that the Psalms were prophecy and inspired. How is it that David speaking in the spirit says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand while I make thine enemies thy footstool. And then Jesus asked the question of them. And what question does he ask? He says to them, if he is son of David, why does David call him Lord? Why does David speaking in the spirit call him Lord? Because there are two figures there. You see, there's the Lord says to my Lord. So in his state of inspiration, David calls the Messiah, my Lord. Now, why was the Messiah called son of David? He was going to be great because he is son of David. Well, he is son of David because he is, he gets his greatness from David. This is what he's trying to say. He gets his greatness from the fact that he is the son of David. Therefore, the Messiah himself should not be greater than the person whose name by through whom he was descended, who gives him his greatness. Do you see my point? Okay. I don't think I expressed that very well. Now in Hebrew, that verse is the Lord. And that's the word Yahweh said to my Lord. And that's the word Adonai. Now Adonai is also used by the Lord, by the Jews, when they get to the word Yahweh in the Hebrew scriptures today. They never pronounce the tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God that we Christians might say, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. Okay, some people pronounce it as Jehovah. It's not, it's not Jehovah, Yahweh, okay? The sacred name of God that was given to Moses, I am who I am, that name is never pronounced. Instead, when they, that's the most common name for God in the Jewish scriptures. When they are reading from the scriptures out loud and they come to those four letters, they substitute the word Adonai, my Lord. So they will literally say, my Lord said to my Lord. Okay. They were doing this in Jesus's time too. They didn't pronounce those words though. They didn't pronounce those letters. Okay. So the, it, in other words, it's speaking again, not only to the fact that as a human being, the Messiah is greater than David, but that the Messiah himself will be the Lord. Do you see my point? So this is extremely important. And, and the, the Pharisees had never thought of this. And so it says in the Gospels, after that, they didn't dare to ask him any questions. Well, I should have hoped not. But you see how important this was, okay? So this 
prophecy about the Messiah, that the Messiah would be greater than David, and that the Messiah would even be the Lord himself, was quoted by the, by the Lord Jesus while he was alive on earth with the disciples. Do you think the disciples heard that exchange with the Pharisees in which he silenced them? Of course they heard it. Of course they remembered it. So um, this is in the Gospels even. And this, by the way, is in the Gospels. It's in, in Acts. It's in many, many places. So this was a very important prophecy that was known in the early church as helping to prove or helping to support the divinity of Christ and Jesus Christ as the Messiah and the Lord. Okay, let's take a little break. And when we come back, we will continue talking about this prophecy and other prophecies and how the early church taught the the Jewish people in Jerusalem that Jesus was the Lord and convinced them of the gospel. Join me. Dr. Constantino will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Let us attend Sunday's Gospel for Children. On November 9, 2007, the first episode of the Let Us Attend podcast aired on Ancient Faith Radio. Since that time, Sunday church schools and families alike have treasured the audio recordings of the Sunday Gospel readings and the illustrated weekly handouts. We look forward to celebrating this fall the 15th anniversary of Let Us Attend. You are invited to join this milestone celebration. We want to hear from you. Visit ancientfaith.com and click on the Let Us Attend survey banner to respond to five questions about your experience and share your personal reflections through Sunday, July 31. Thank you. Let Us Attend, Sunday's Gospel for Children, is a production of the Antiochian Orthodox Department of Christian Education in partnership with Ancient Faith Radio. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. Okay, yes. Didn't you love that sweet little voice? I just love hearing little children's voices. That's so wonderful. Whether whether they're chanting or reading, they're just so precious, aren't they? Just You can't help but smile, right, when you hear that beautiful little voice. So, did the apostles remember that exchange between the Lord and the Pharisees? Absolutely they did. So even before his crucifixion and resurrection, the Lord was teaching the disciples and actually probably other passages from the scriptures as well, because we know that after the great confession of St. Peter, remember this is in Matthew chapter 16, when the Lord says to the apostles, he had sent them out for a mission. And he says, um, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some people say that you are uh, John the Baptist come alive again. Some people say you're a prophet, you're Jeremiah, whomever. And he says, well, who do you say that I am? I love that. It was really direct. So Peter says right away, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And the Lord says, well, it is not flesh and blood that revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven, he's the one who revealed this to you. He's the one who made this known to you. In other words, this is divine illumination, divine inspiration that he received this understanding. But after that, it tells us, after that, the Lord began to teach. Once they realized that he was the Messiah, Peter said it, Jesus confirmed it. He began to teach them that he was going to suffer and to die. And then later, Peter comes along and says, no, no, we can't allow this to happen. And that's when the Lord says, get thee behind me, Satan. But the point is right there in the Gospels, it tells us that the Lord began to teach them. Well, how did he teach them? Certainly by mentioning the scriptures. So these things were very well known to the apostles, okay? Even before the resurrection. Now that didn't make his arrest and crucifixion any easier. It still happened in a, a way that they didn't anticipate. Remember, they were still expecting him to triumphantly enter Jerusalem and take over as the king. We have James and John 
who were among the closest to him, along with Peter. We have that little little uh, group of three, Peter, James, and John, who were so close to the Lord, and they went to him and said, we want to know if we can sit at your right hand and your left. They have no idea. That's right before they entered Jerusalem. So in spite of the fact that the Lord was telling them these things, it really didn't sink in. They truly did not understand it. But we, so my point is that he was teaching these things to them, and they certainly understood it better after the resurrection, and it continued after the resurrection when he met with them many, many times, even on the day of resurrection. That's what happens to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas and the other disciple, whether it was Luke or not, we don't know. But it, it tells us in the Gospel of Luke that um, he pretended not to know what had happened. They said, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know about the things that have happened there. And he says, what things? And they told him. And then it tells us the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So this is the very first day of the resurrection. Do you think that those apostles forgot what they learned from the Lord, all the various prophecies and how they were fulfilled by Christ? Of course not. This, these things were preserved in the church. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm telling you this uh, because I have heard academics say that uh, later the followers of Jesus found these prophecies and they kind of applied them to Jesus. But obviously that's not the case because we see the Lord himself in the scriptures, in the gospels, applying them to himself, Right. So we know that he taught these things to the apostles even before his crucifixion and resurrection, and certainly on the day of resurrection. So I'm sure that the church continued to pour over the scriptures and interpret them in the light of Christ, but we have to remember that it was Christ himself who first gave us the interpretation of these prophecies, and we know them today. We have them today. They were preserved by the apostles this is what the apostles taught the first believers. This is what I'm getting at. This is how they established the church in Jerusalem. All the first believers were Jews. They didn't leave from Jerusalem for a while. We don't know how long. Did the church remain in Jerusalem for a year, two years, three years? We don't know. But the church remained in Jerusalem for a rather long time, and all of their teaching was based upon how as they, they appealed to their fellow Jews by showing how Jesus fulfilled these prophecies and that these interpretations were given by Christ himself. This is what, to the apostles. This is why apostolic tradition is so important. The church received its understanding of who the Lord was from the Lord himself. So everything we do uh, in orthodoxy has to come through the apostles because they're the, our connection to Christ. This is our touchstone. This is our, our measure, our, our, the, the measure by which we weigh truth. Was it taught in the early church? And by the way, this is one reason why the Septuagint is so important. Oh, I started to say, um, I, I wrote, read to you that in the Hebrew version, whether it's in the Hebrew or in the Greek, the Lord says to my Lord, whether it's Hebrew or in Greek, it's still making the same point. In Greek, it is still the Lord says to my Lord. In English, it's the word Lord twice. In Hebrew, it's Yahweh and Adonai, but it's still a divine person. In Greek, it's Ipenokirios tokiriomu. And this, you can hear the word Kyrios twice. Ipen o Kyrios, the Lord said, said the Lord to my Lord, to Kyriomu. It says that in Greek. So it's the word Kyrios. And the word Kyrios is the word for Lord. We still use that word for Lord. Most even Christians, other Christians recognize the word Kyrios from Kyria eleison as, as referring to Lord. So... In a way, we could we could say more about that theologically speaking, but I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go any farther. But the point is that the church, the the, the Septuagint here we have the the Hebrew Bible. Um, yes, we have the the Hebrew Bible, have the Hebrew text, but other things here 
were also very important that I kind of skipped over in this particular. Now, Peter only quoted this very first verse of Psalm 109 Septuagint or 110 in the Western numbering. The Lord says to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make the enemies thy footstool. Now, whenever you read a verse from the Bible that is supposed to be fulfillment of prophecy, that they're calling upon as fulfillment of prophecy, try to look it up and read the whole thing because usually they're calling upon that very first verse, whether it's Isaiah 53, they're just quoting the first verse. It's supposed to, rec- rather that they don't sit and quote the whole thing. You are supposed to realize that they're directing you toward that particular prophecy. You're supposed to go and read the whole thing, you see? So what else do we have in this messianic psalm? The whole psalm was messianic. I mentioned that you are priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. But here it says also, um, I have begotten thee from the womb before the morning star. Here is also a claim of divinity. And we say this at, um, we say this verse, this is, I think the Prokeman on a Christmas or something. So before the womb, from the womb before the morning star, have I begotten thee? Now in the, in the Hebrew version, it does not say that in the Hebrew version. It doesn't talk about being begotten. Okay, doesn't have that, but it's there in the Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint was very important. It's still important. I just want to take a moment to explain to you why the Septuagint is so important in the Orthodox faith. It was the Bible of the early church. Now, why was it the Bible of the early church? Because it was the Bible of most Jews. Now, this is the part that people have difficulty understanding. The Septuagint was created not by Christians, but by Jews about 300 years before the time of Christ, around the year maybe 250 BC, because most Jews were in diaspora. That is, they did not live in Palestine. They lived in Babylon and Greece and Asia Minor and Egypt and Rome, the Jews had scattered all over the Middle East and they did not know Hebrew. So they needed a translation in Greek of their scriptures. So the Septuagint was created by Jews. And by the time of the early church, it had already been in use for about 300 years. So they didn't have any issue with it not being um, reliable as a translation. I, I just want you to understand that sometimes Christians argue over it. Orthodox Christians or will, Protestants will argue with Orthodox Christians about the Septuagint. I just want you to understand the reason why we continue to use it is not just because it has a few extra books. Those books in and of themselves are not that important. It's the fact that um, the church's liturgical language and theological language and countless allusions and references in the New Testament come from the Septuagint. And that was how the church related to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Because the Jews were using the Septuagint, because they, that was their scriptures. When the, the, you don't imagine that everybody knew Hebrew. Don't imagine that there was such a thing as a bar mitzvah. That didn't exist. This rejection of the Greek in favor of Hebrew happened much later, and it happened because of the rise of the Christian faith. The Jews were Hellenized. The Jews spoke Greek. They did not know Hebrew. Now, you weren't going to turn around and teach everybody Hebrew. So, the Jews were using the Septuagint because they had used it for hundreds of years. That means they considered it accurate. They also considered it to be an inspired translation. There was a, a story that it was translated by 70 Jews, 70 scholars in 70 days, and it was, they all agreed. So there was this idea that it was an inspired translation. So over the centuries, they had proven and had accepted it as accurate, trustworthy, and true. It isn't until Christians begin to use it to prove that Jesus is the Messiah that they begin to say, wait a, wait a minute, wait a minute, you can't use that. You can only use Hebrew. 
Okay. And the reason why this happened is because with the rise of the Christian faith, they were using these scriptures to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. And since most Jews didn't, most Christians did not know Hebrew. And by the, that's not just pagan Christians, but Jewish Christians did not know Hebrew. They were using the Septuagint. So that was a way for them to say, well, you, you don't understand it correctly, or you're not using the right version. Now, ordinarily, a work in the original language is superior to a translation, but not in the case of the Hebrew Bible. And here's why. Let's try to pay attention to this and try to understand what I'm saying, because what I'm trying to do is give you clarity about what we mean by Masoretic text. I'm hoping that you will use terminology accurately. Make sure you do. Don't be loosey goosey when it comes to terminology. Terminology is very important in theology. When we talk about the Hebrew Bible, when people will sometimes say to me, for example, was Jesus reading from the Septuagint? For example, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, when he's reading from the book of Isaiah, or was he reading from the Masoretic text? He could not be reading from the Masoretic text. There was no Masoretic text. There was a Hebrew Bible. Now, somebody once misquoted me as saying that the Septuagint was older than the Hebrew. Of course not. The Septuagint is a translation. Septuagint is not older than Hebrew. The Septuagint is much older than the Masoretic text. So try to understand that there's a difference between the Hebrew Bible, the original Hebrew, and the Masoretic text. So I'm going to explain to you what that is and why it matters. The original scriptures, Jewish scriptures, were written in Hebrew. That is not the same as the Masoretic text. The original Hebrew, the Hebrew alphabet, has no vowels. It's just a collection of consonants. Now, eventually, but people knew how to pronounce it. And there was a kind of a tradition, but there was some discussion about what a word meant, because if you were reading a book that only had consonants, there was, would be some words that could go either way, depending upon what, how you chose to pronounce them. That's the Hebrew original. From the Hebrew original, Greek-speaking Jews, Hellenistic Jews, translated and created the Septuagint. That was hundreds of years before the beginning of the church, before the birth of Christ, 200 at least to 250 years before Christ. Now, a thousand years after the time of Christ, in the 900s or around the year 1000, in Europe, a group of Jews did not like the fact that the Hebrew Bible could be interpreted in various ways depending upon how you chose to pronounce it. Why? Because the Hebrew alphabet contains no vowels. So if I write even two letters, S-N, what is S-N? Is S-N son? Is it soon? Is it seen? Is it S-O-N or S-U-N? What is the word? So you, you have a lot of flexibility there. Because even today, modern Hebrew has no vowels. If you go to Jerusalem and you can read Hebrew, you see the street signs. It says J-R, well, it's not really J, it's a Yod, a yod R-S-L-M, okay? But if you can read it, you say, oh, that's Jerusalem, okay? So the Hebrew alphabet has no vowels. What does that mean? That means that you can interpret it in different ways. Well, in the Middle Ages... There were Jews who did not like that. They wanted to standardize the way the, the text, the Bible was pronounced. That means they wanted to fix the meaning, not just the pronunciation. They don't, the pronunciation is what does the word mean? What word is it? So they wanted to standardize the Hebrew Bible and they added certain dots and dashes 
under the letters because they couldn't create, they couldn't alter the text itself because it's the Bible. So they created dots and dashes, which they put under the letters and above the letters. And they tell you how to pronounce the word. That's the Masoretic text. It has only been around for 1000 years, but that became the standard Bible of the Jews. And today, when the Bible is translated, most translations are done from the Masoretic text, but it is a Jewish version of the Bible standardized according to what they decided it meant. Are you following what I'm telling you? And standardized according to what their Hebrew text was in the year 1000, not 1000 BC, 1000 AD, a thousand years ago. So the Septuagint is 1,200 years older than the Masoretic text. It's not older than the original Hebrew, but we don't have the original Hebrew. The original Hebrew is not the Masoretic text. We have some parts of the Bible in Hebrew preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you know Hebrew and you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, you will, or you, you could look at the, you could see pictures of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's no dots or dashes under them. If you doubt, doubt what I'm saying, you can find this on the internet, look up Masoretic text and look at pictures of it. And you can see dots and dashes, then look up the Dead Sea Scrolls and you will see that there are no dots and dashes. So at the time of Christ, the Masoretic text did not exist. And we have no way of knowing except for some of those manuscripts of the Dead Sea Scrolls that have survived, we have no way of knowing how all of the various manuscripts of Hebrew read what they said or how people pronounced them. We don't know because <laughs> they, the, the vowels are not there. So what is important about the Septuagint is that it preserved a snapshot of how the words were pronounced. In other words, when they sat down, when the, the Jewish scholars sat down to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek, they had an understanding of what those words were. And then they translated them into Greek, which meant that is kind of telling you what the Jews understood the prophecies to be referring to. And this was long before there was a church. These are Jews, and they are expressing what they believe the scriptures were saying to them. You, can you see what I'm trying to, say, trying to say? This is very different from what the Masoretes did later, because the, after the time of the church, I mean, after the beginning of the church, the Jews decided to reject the Greek, not only the Septuagint, but eventually all, all Greek, because they were saying that it was distorted because of course they didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ. And here, here, here people were saying, but it says this in the scriptures and it says this, and it says this, and Jesus fulfilled this. And Jesus, I will give you another example. And this is in my book, the crucifixion of the King of glory. If you read the, uh, the text and, and the Jew, the Jewish interpretation, even the Jewish, well, the Jews will tell you today. And some Christians are saying the Hebrew does not say, um, um, this is not in my book. I, I took a little side turn. The Hebrew does not say the virgin will conceive and bear a son. The Hebrew says the young maiden. The Hebrew says the young woman. No, it doesn't. The Hebrew says Alma, the concealed one. But the translators knew that this meant a virgin. Okay, so that's why they translated a virgin, because there's no word in Greek for concealed one. A woman who is being protected from men, okay, because she's going to be married and she's not exposed. She's not running around in public. She's concealed. That's what they, uh, they understood what the prophecy meant. So they chose the appropriate word, okay? Now, in my book, A Crucifixion of King of Glory, I mentioned this. The Masoretes changed and the Jews changed the place in Psalm 22 where it said, or Psalm 21, where it says, they have pierced my hands and my feet. They changed it to mean like a lion. They are at my hands and my feet. And it was very, very easy to change. 
Okay, and there's a picture, there's a footnote that explains to you how they did that. It's with the slightest, slightest stroke, they were able to change it. So what I'm trying to tell you is that the Jesus did not read or quote from the Masoretic text, but from the Hebrew Bible. And by the way, there were many different manuscripts, and they did not necessarily agree. So when you talk about Jesus reading in Hebrew or anything else, the church using Hebrew, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with the Hebrew Bible. The, the Septuagint is not a completely different Bible. Let's not exaggerate. Let's not overdo it in our defense of the Septuagint. If you want to defend the Septuagint, I want you to defend it on the basis of why it is important, because this was the Bible of the early church. This was the language of the church. This is the language of the Psalms. This is the language of the prophets. This is the language by which the church evangelized the world, both Jews and Gentiles. So this is why it's important. It preserved the apostolic teaching. And when it's translated into English, this is why people will read the, they'll read the Gospels and they will say, well, he's not quoting from the, the Septuagint here. Well, even sometimes, yes, sometimes even the Gospels or other uh, New Testament writers are not quoting, but they might be quoting Hebrew, but it's a different manuscript. Now, today, the Jews have a custom of being so careful when they copy their scrolls that they don't allow for more than two mistakes. If there are three mistakes in a scroll, it is, it is destroyed. That wasn't the case back in the time of Jesus. We know there were manuscript variations. When there's a lot of ways we know that, but I'm not going to, to, I'm not going to explain to you. But the point is that since, especially since the Reformation, with a rejection of the Septuagint, because Luther rejected the Septuagint, the Masoretes have succeeded in getting Christians to reject their own tradition, to follow Jewish versions of the scriptures, some of which are actually skewed to deny that Christ fulfilled the prophecies. So today, almost all translations of the Old Testament, regardless of the language, whether they're translated into English or French or, or you know, Hindi or anything else, almost all of them are translated from the Masoretic text, not the Septuagint. But the Orthodox Church insists upon the Septuagint, not because we're stubborn or because we're Greeks, but because we know that the early church used this version. Remember that the Lord brought the Lord was incarnate in the world at a time when there was a common language and that language was Greek and the Jews were using the Greek language. Almost all of them knew Greek Greek. Okay. And the church was using the Greek language to evangelize. There was no way the church could have evangelized in the Hebrew language for a lot of reasons, besides the fact that Hebrew wasn't well known, but also Hebrew does not, does not have the the depth of expression, the, the 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 fineness of expression, the technical ability to express certain theological concepts. Hebrew simply doesn't have the vocabulary to say the things that were needed to be said about Jesus Christ and about the Trinity, doesn't have the vocabulary to say it. So God was incarnate. The Son of God was incarnate at a certain time, and the Greek language was very important for the preaching of the gospel. And this was the gospel, and this was the Old Testament of the church and of the Jews at that time. So I think it's very, very important uh, that we that we remember this. The Greek Septuagint text was not altered, but the Hebrew was altered to change verses. And um, they, l later the Jews said, oh, but it was incorrect or it was a bad translation or whatever. But we know, we know for certain that the Jews changed the translations of certain passages or changed the text because it was not standardized even before the Masoretic text came along when they just had the Hebrew without the little vowel indicators. There was no standardized Hebrew text. So when it came to decide which of these two, let's say, manuscripts, because remember, all books were hand copied. All books were hand copied. And because of this, there were little variations that crept into the text. 
So if you were Jewish and you were looking at a passage and one of them read it in such a way, one of them said, like a lion, they're at my hands and my feet. And the other one said, um, they have pierced my hands and my feet. And you want to decide which one is more accurate and you're Jewish and you're opposed to the Christian faith. Which one are you going to pick? So whether they intentionally altered it or they just consistently chose um, manuscripts that contained this particular version that contradicted Christian claims, there is no doubt that the Jews altered or or intentionally chose passages that did not, that contradicted Christian claims. Not only is this stated in early fathers like Justin Martyr, but Rabbi Akiba himself, a famous rabbi from the second century, said so. Okay, so it's not just a Christian claim, but a Jewish claim. It's an, it's an acknowledgement. They considered those manuscripts to be false. It doesn't matter whether or not they were supported, whether or not the Greek Septuagint matched the Hebrew. So today we look at the Greek Septuagint as a very important thing. By the way, today, ultimately the Jews rejected the Septuagint and all Greek translations. But today... Uh, there's a renewed interest in the in the Septuagint. It used to be you couldn't get anybody except Orthodox to be interested in the Septuagint. Today, a lot of scholars are interested in the Septuagint because they recognize that the Septuagint preserves a form of the Hebrew original that has now been lost. I hope you understood what I was saying. How was the Hebrew original lost? Because the Septuagint was created 200, 250 years before Christ. And the only Hebrew, we have some books, we have a lot of books in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but the Masoretic text is very recent. So now for, for now on, I hope you will understand the difference between the Masoretic text and the Hebrew original. If anybody uses the Hebrew original to refer and uses Masoretic text to refer to the Hebrew original that was used at the time of Jesus, correct them, okay? Because you should never call that the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text refers to a specific version of the Hebrew Bible that was created a thousand years after the time of Christ and likely contains a distorted version of the Hebrew that was created by the Jews after the time of Christ to dismiss Christian claims about Jesus, to deny that he actually fulfill Jewish prophecies. Well, I was hoping we would get to the end of chapter two today, but I'm, I hope that you found this um, useful to you. After, the, after St. Peter quotes the, this prophecy, he says, let the house of Israel know that God has made him, this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And after this, they ask him, what are we supposed to do now? And he tells them to repent and be baptized. So we're going to have to pick this up next week as we continue our study of the early church in the book of Acts of the Apostles. So now let's close with our prayer. Lord, now let your servants depart in peace according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Amen. Good night.